long day, a great day for Derby. I hope you've made lots of new friends or seen some old friends. I always enjoy doing these SFL conferences. It uh, makes me feel really good about the future. I see all you young people. Good looking young people, you dress so nicely, <laughs> so polite. I mean, there's really hope for the future, so keep rocking, guys. Tonight I'm going to talk about the origins and nature of law. That's a big topic. I cannot really cover this exhaustively, because it would be exhausting. But we're going to hit some highlights. We're going to do some kind of interesting, crazy stuff. I've never, i got to say, I've never done this before. What we're going to try tonight. We're going to do a live reading of a script I finished last night at about midnight. <laughs> I got some volunteers. We're going to have some live music. And uh, I don't know if it's going to work, but it'll be fun. Certainly it'll be fun. We'll give it a try. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what the law is, at least from one point of view, where it came from, the origins of the law, and a sort of speculative look at where the law might go in our lifetime. So let's start with what the law is. And here's a question. I, you want to take the fourth on this. It's fine. But I'm going to ask if anybody wants to volunteer information. Or maybe just let's have a show. How many people you broke the law today? Show of hands. <laughs> of course we did. <laughs> I read something interesting about that recently. It was suggested by, um, I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten who. Maybe one of you remembers. It was suggested by some by writing online. You should break the law once in a while. You should break the, wall, the law once in a while deliberately to kind of build up your strength for when it's really important to break the law. <laughs> now you laugh at it, it's charming. It's a charming idea, but it's a good idea. You know, once in a while say, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jaywalk. Because <laughs> you don't always want to be obedient. You want to develop that muscle where you'll stand up to authority when it really matters. And most people, when they think about the law, they think about the state. It's totally natural. That's the lawgiver that we fear most. They have the biggest and most guns in the jails, etc. It's a very common view, but I want us to try to think about the law in another way. So here's the traditional view about the law and the state. That if we didn't have the state giving us the law, we'd go to heck in a handbasket. Hobbes wrote Leviathan, and he said, it's manifest that if men do not live under a common power, it's a war. Every man against every man. It's a very common view. I just don't think it's accurate. I want to offer you a different view of the matter. This is one of my favorite molecules. Anybody recognize any chemists here? It's caffeine. <laughs> caffeine. Still legal, may have remained so. Um, and one thing I want to offer, if you, if you don't remember anything else, I got a rhetorical device you might be able to put to good use. You always hear libertarians accused of atomistic individualism. You always, you've heard that, right? It happens all the time. People give that to you, I want you to embrace it and use it. What you say is, okay, I do think that individuals are a lot like atoms because I'm sophisticated. If I were a chemist, I would want to study atoms if I were studying molecules. But the important thing is that these atomistic individuals join into social molecules. And you collectivists only talk about the molecules. What kind of chemistry is that? You could kill people with that kind of chemistry. <laughs> I'm sophisticated. I understand the way the world works. That's what I want you to use. And I'm rolling it out here because when people join together in organizations, they create the law to regulate their lives together. That is a source of the law also. The law comes not just from the state, but it comes from any social organization that regulates human behavior. Let's look at what Lon Fuller, one of my favorite jurisprudence, had to say about it. This is basically the definition of law that I advocate. You at least try on for a while. Try this on for size. You may not end up buying it wholeheartedly, but try it out. And by the way, I know some of you, maybe all of you guys were wondering. So this guy found his wife at, a, at an IGES seminar. What was his pickup line? I don't want to share it with you. <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility, boys. So be careful with this one. So we, there were like, what, 12 libertarians in the world back then. This was 1980, uh, 1988. And we were all in this one room, and we were introducing each other. And, you know, hi, my name's Bob. And tell us something about yourself. Bob. Came to me, and uh, she's made these big eyes at me. And I said, hi, my name's Tom. And one thing about me, I'm trying out anarcho-capitalism for a year. Now, she's a very special lady to find that turn on. <laughs> Not a lot of us out there, guys. But the important point is, you know, it's worth your while to at least try on ideas for a while. And this is one I want you to try on. 
Think about the law and the enterprise of subjecting human conduct to the governance rules. Now, Lon Fuller noted that that is a very broad definition, and you might object. Wow, it's too broad. That permits the existence of more than one legal system. And he says, yeah, because that's the way the world is. That's the way history has unrolled. He says, every one of these social molecules, churches, schools, labor unions, trade associations, 101 other forms of human association. They all create systems of law, because why? They are all enterprises of subjecting human conduct to the governance of rules. So the law is basically an enterprise the same way that a dry cleaner is an enterprise, or enterprise rent cars is an enterprise. It's a service industry. Now it happens to be a service industry that is monopolized by the state. And what happens when you have a monopoly? We don't have to wonder about this. We have a great example right here in Washington, D.C. So this is a map of Washington, D.C. And uh, many of you, have, I'm sure, worked in D.C. You know about it. It's broken up in quadrants, basically. So we have here northwest D.C., northeast, and southeast. And down here, there used to be a southwest D.C. and they kind of escaped. Virginians got away. <laughs> so this is a map of homicides. It's a little dated now. This is from 2004, 2006. The drug war was pretty hot in D.C. back then. But you'll notice something funny going on here. There's a whole lot of murders in these regions and not much here. Now, somebody who's from D.C. or knows the region, what's characteristic of Northwest? There's a few things that are characteristic, but I'm looking for something in particular. What's, what's, it, what's going on in Northwest? Uh, Right? It's, it's, it's richer. It's richer, and that helps. Although we're, we should wonder about the cause and effect there. You know, maybe it's richer because you know the rich people move to the nicer neighborhoods. A little hard to disentangle this, John. Foreign embassy. What's that? The foreign embassies. Foreign embassies are there. All the foreign embassies, and you would have thought of that too. Well, there's a funny thing about embassies. Those of you who've done international law, tell me how this would work out, DC or anywhere. You have an ambassador. She's driving down Connecticut Avenue, and she runs over a pedestrian. What happens? Does she get hailed into local court? She doesn't. She does not get hailed into local court. Basically, she lives under the law of her embassy's uh, you know, the home country. And it's, a, it's basically a diplomatic issue. You've got to go work it out. So there's all these embassies up here, and all these people are kind of wandering around in public in their little bubbles of law from Estonia, Brazil, Japan. So this is the least monolithic area of law, perhaps in the world. There's all these individuals going around under their own laws. And it's the most peaceful place in DC. And you've probably lived in the Northwest. It's a great place to live. I mean, it's not perfect. You got the DC government. Very <laughs> sad. Not many embassies over here. So those embassy people are staying over here. Their embassies tell them, don't go to Northeast or Southeast. Very dangerous. Good advice. Over here, we have a very interesting phenomenon. DC is a very interesting place for a number of reasons. One reason is it's the most monolithic government in the United States in what way? Well, in other places, if you're in California, you have this kind of overlay of different governments, right? You've got federal government, and then you have the state government, and then you maybe have some kind of local city government, and they all kind of overlap. It doesn't happen here. It's the federal government, 100% basically. There is a DC government, they pass regs, but really they're under the supervision of Congress. So this is probably the most monolithic law in the United States. And it's the most dangerous place. Now Hobbes said, oh, we have to have one law to make it safe. Uh, it's not working here. And Hobbes suggests very strongly, if you have a polycentric legal system, oh my god, it's going to be really dangerous. It's not happening either. Now this does not prove everything. It's what we call sort of an existence proof. At least it shows you can have a bunch of people. Maybe it only works when they're you know, rich and sophisticated and they're from foreign countries. Maybe it only works then. But certainly you cannot say, if you have a lot of people living in close proximity, each of them under their own legal systems, that everyone kills everybody. That doesn't seem to be true. And it's also not true that if you have a very monolithic system, oh, that cleans things up. It's just interesting to think about that. So think about the law as allowing these different types these, these different types of organization. So I'm going to show you now a video. I made this with Learn Liberty, and I have a couple reasons for doing this. One is, Andre asked me to do this talk on a very short notice. <laughs> Somebody canceled. And so this uh, kind of buys me about four or five minutes so that I didn't have to prepare anything for you. 
<laughs> but I want to show you this video because I want you to know about Learn Liberty. Has anybody here heard about Learn Liberty before? It's a great resource for you and your friends. You run into a friend on campus and he asks you, I don't know about fair trade, I worry about sweatshops. You can go find a Learn Liberty video for that person. Send it to them via a link in the email, perhaps. Because a lot of people won't read a book. And maybe you kind of garble the argument. So go to Learn Liberty, shop there for things that will help you make a case for your views, and you'll learn stuff too. I also want you to look at this video because we're going to do this crazy thing at the end of my talk. We're going to do a live reading of a script I finished, like I say, last night about midnight. And, and they want me to, they want me to learn liberty to create a, a video about charter cities. And this is the way we've done it in the past. He said, Tom, you're already kind of on the fringe of what we do. We want you to take that a little further. So let's look at how it works in um, this case. And uh, Andrew, I hope I don't need your help here. There we go. And I got to get rid of this. Welcome. <laughs> so uh, that's an example. That's an example of a Learn Liberty video. And uh, you know, I'm the son of a librarian, and I guess, uh, yeah. What do I do here? I just like this one. And here. I guess for me, like uh, an action shot is picking up a book, and they want me to do something a little more uh, interesting and dynamic. Hold on. I want to do from current slide. Go uh, back. Oh, that's good. Okay. All right, so I'm going to be running the script past you soon, and I want to get your feedback. I want to know, you know is it going to be a little more accessible? They've said at, at IHS, we want to reach more people, not just hardcore libertarians. They're already kind of sold on what we do. So, you know, make it a little more, what can I say, accessible? I'm not sure what they want. No. <laughs> but we'll figure it out. And another point I want to make about this rule of law point is, if law is an enterprise of subjecting human conduct to the government's rules, but we hit that enterprise, it's kind of like a business, and think about what you want. If you're a shopper for legal services, what do you want? Of course you want efficiency, you don't want it to be too expensive, but I would argue the rule of law is something you would want. It's something consumers of legal services really want. And we have to ask, who can best provide that? Will states provide that? Well, we saw that DC example. Do you think those people live in Northeast and Southeast think they're getting the rule of law, but they came to step outside? front door without worrying about being shot. And some of you may have dealt with, maybe John, you dealt with the DC government. Uh, yeah, is that clean and efficient, straightforward? Hard. All right, so let's, um, let's move on and talk about the law's origins. Actually, let me take a breath here and see. Any questions about what the law is? I've introduced you to this kind of radical notion, I hope you'll at least try it on for size, that it doesn't have to come from the state. It's really an all-purpose service that you can get from lots of sources, and we're going to wrap up today talking about how Purely private providers may could give us our legal systems. All right, let's talk now briefly about the origins of the law. This is um, basically a legal proceeding. There are no judges wearing robes and wigs, but this is adjudication of a case in uh, Sumatra, some sort of a tribal society here. And the point I want to make by showing you this image is the law does not have to come from books and legislatures and judges. Indeed. I don't think you can imagine humans who are social animals living together without the law. Humans need rules. Humans are rule-following creatures. How long have states been around? Well, you know, this is debated, but I don't think anyone can debate that humans have been living together in societies for a very long time, much longer than states have existed. States, to me, frankly, are just kind of bubbles in the froth of history, relatively recent uh, phenomena. If you look at historical examples in the deep past, you will find people living together without states and yet enjoying the law. Maybe it's not the kind of law we're used to, and it may not be perfect. It certainly isn't. No legal system is. And Hayek had an explanation for this. Hayek, I like this picture of Hayek. I don't know if you can tell, but he's got a little glass in his hand here. <laughs> Hayek. <So> Hayek. <laughs> he's probably going on about spontaneous orders, and that's what I'm going to quote him on. I am in uh, one of the uh, law, legislation, and liberty. My favorite high work. Volumes one and two. Three is okay. One and two. Here's a quote from volume one. He basically says, "Hi, if you want to understand the law, you have to understand something about evolution. They're actually related, because because the law has evolved with human society. Society can exist only if, by a process of selection, rules have evolved, which lets which let social life happen." So you can imagine how this, you can do a thought experiment, you can imagine how this worked out. You might have had two societies living side by side at one point. 
and maybe one of them recognized property rights and one of them didn't. You don't have to say a lot for you to figure out what happened there. Now, you, know, you don't have to think. It doesn't mean, you know, people talk about, they talk about um, uh, you know, natural selection in the social environment and they think somehow that it's a Darwinian process, that, that, that something Herbert Spencer described, that the people who have certain rules that are better go out and kill the other people. No, that's not really how it works. Here. What happens is the people without property rights kind of look over the fence. Well, the other people's fence, because they don't have fence. <laughs> they look over the other people's fence and they go, huh, they have lots of yams and pigs, and we're over here scratching in the dirt with hideous infections and dying. What are they doing next door that we can adopt? I think our property rights, what's that? Well, let's go ask them. And they learn. And these ideas diffuse, not because people are dying, although that does happen, and not because warfare, although that happens too, but most because people are smart, and they want good things, and they learn from each other. So through evolution, these rules percolate and, and, and spread, and good rules get adopted all through human life, even before the state is created, because law predates the state. And so he says, at least in primitive human society, scarcely less than in animal societies, the structure of social life is determined by rules of conduct, conduct which we simply observe. We simply observe it. You can see the law, in some sense, in property rights, at work in the natural world. No one writes it down, but it's out there. How do we know? We see property rights in nature because we observe it. You go outside and you hear birds singing. It's a beautiful camp, it's a lovely day, you hear birds singing. What are they saying? They're saying one of two things, basically. They're saying either, hey, dude, check out this nest. Or they're saying, this is my nest, you come over here and I'm going to pick out your eyes. That's what the birds are saying, basically. You hear singing, that's what they're saying. So that's property rights, really. Now, we have a much more sophisticated version of this. But basically, the notion I want you to walk away with is that the law evolves as a spontaneous order, which we can formalize and have formalized in strictures and words and things, but that's not where the law comes from. It originates in a very organic process, a very natural process. Indeed, part of the libertarian drive is to go back and find those natural rules, the natural laws that help us live together. All right, so that's the origin of the law. Again, I'll take a breath. So you got any questions about that? Again, for some of you, it might be a radical notion. I'm sure many of you walk in here thinking, well, I know what the law is. It comes from courts, and the legislature writes it down, and I follow their orders. Well, I would say, you know what those are? Those are commandments. Those are simply orders. That's not really the law. The law is something more natural, something more fitted to the way humans really are versus the way a few humans want us to behave. All right? All right, so this is a picture of a laboratory, because we're going to try this experiment with my my very helpful uh, volunteers, we got Alexandra, Maureen, and Carlos. Come on up, guys. And uh, we're going to try to redo this script. Uh, we have not practiced this yet, so we've got us some slack. And I'm, I'm going to have images up here that are, this is kind of how I wrote the script. Now, the last time, i got to say, this is, I told you guys, that the first time it didn't work too well. I wrote a script for Free Cities, about Free Cities, and I sent it to Learn Liberty. And they kind of tore it apart. It was a little wacky. They did say to me, Tom, you're doing kind of stuff that's already in the edge of what we produced, so you know, you know, go out there on the edge a little more. And I created something that had a dream sequence and some sci-fi, and they said, no, not that far. <laughs> you gotta pull it back in. So this is actually the toned down version, much toned down of what I had. And uh, my lovely daughter, if she will get up here, is gonna start out, we're gonna do this professionally, we're gonna have live music, because you know, you watch a video, it's got the musical start, right? So we're gonna have imaginations a little bit and uh, the rich sounds and velvet undercurrents of my voice will need to create some images for you. So are you guys ready for this? Yes? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Scene one, college campus. <laughs> I don't buy it. You think we need more cities? Not just any cities. Free cities. Look at it this way. The poorest people in the world suffer from the worst governments. Free cities offer them an escape. An escape to what? Neo-colonialism? You must not have read your homework. Oh, I read it. Critically. <laughs> Other sources have convinced me that developing countries don't need more aid. They need more trade. Maybe. But should foreigners impose it on them? <coughs> no, 
No, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. It's, well, hey, let's ask Professor Bell. He studies free cities. <laughs> Professor Bell. Hello, Leo, Paige, how can I help? We're having an argument. Discussion. About free cities. A fascinating topic. I was just heading to my office. Come along. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Scene two, the fountain. Think of government like a service industry, one that provides its clients with laws, police, and courts. The quality of governing services varies widely from state to state. The best states are okay, the worst are very bad indeed. Some states have even slaughtered and starved their subjects. How can we make governments better? <coughs> Reforms? Voting. Good answers, but we've tried those solutions time and again, and yet bad governments persist. Scene three. They stand outside Professor Bell's office, and he opens the door. Why do states ignore or even violate the consent of those they govern? Because they can. Exactly. States won't change until they face competition. They enter and they sit. <laughs> states already face competition. Immigration and capital flows, for instance. Yes, and, but immigration can't help everybody, and some capital, like factories and farms, can't flee from bad governments. Tell her how free cities can help. No. Tell me what free cities are. <laughs> OK, but better yet, I'll show you. Free cities gave birth to human civilization, even before the wonders of ancient Greece. Networks of independent cities rose and fell. The Hanseatic League, a loose confederation of trading ports helped Northern Europe weather the Middle Ages. Italian city-states, like Naples, Florence, and Venice, Venice inspired the Renaissance. Okay, but that was a long time ago. Where are the free cities today? There are still a lot of small countries. Monaco, Andorra, Malta, Liechtenstein. Yeah, real powerhouses of world history. <laughs> well, Maybe those countries haven't fought many wars, but small countries have helped keep Europe relatively free. And how? By forcing big governments to compete for people and resources. Right, Leo. And consider the impact that Hong Kong has had on China. As an English territory, Hong Kong flourished under liberal trade policies, limited government, and the rule of law. When the Chinese took over Hong Kong in 1997, they could have destroyed it. Instead, they followed its example and created special economic zones on the mainland that have helped millions of people escape from poverty. Okay, I see how competition can make governments better, but I don't see how we're going to get a new Monaco or Hong Kong. States have a thing against giving up territory. That's probably right, Paige. But plenty of states have shown their willingness to create free trade zones, free ports, and other special development regions. They often have to if they want to attract foreign investment and grow their local economies. Free cities just take the trend uh, a little further. Right. Consider Dubai. It's adopted civil and commercial rules designed for the needs of international business. We might call it not just a free trade zone, but a free law zone. Maybe setting up a special legal system worked in Dubai. But it didn't work too well in Honduras, did it? They never even got a chance to try. You're both right about that. The Honduran legislature approved a bold plan for creating new free, new free cities, a plan that would have allowed private parties operating under public supervision to create quasi-sovereign communities. But it proved too bold a plan for the Honduran Supreme Court to stomach, and they shut it down. Privately provided governments? That is bold. Why not? There are already the private developments in the U.S. as big as towns. Maybe they won't happen in Honduras, but private free cities are coming. 
Maybe, Leo. Maybe. Who can say? History does show, however, that the competition provided by free cities can help protect us from the dangers of unfree states. Scene four, back to campus. Paige and Leo walk shoulder by shoulder, chatting amiably. <laughs> well, Leo, maybe you're not crazy. I can see why states need competition and how free cities can provide that. So you'll come with me to the first free city in Honduras? <laughs> Are crazy. <laughs> <laughs>